Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kobe, I can't help but notice that much of the discussion surrounding the national defense strategy and great power competition discusses increased investments in tactical aircraft, missiles, armored vehicles, other large weapons platforms. What I haven't heard much about are investments in transportation and logistics um, uh, systems that can operate in a contested environment to support these weapons platforms. For example, the numbers of U.S. flagged ships has gone down significantly. Um, what is your assessment of the current state of U.S. military transportation and logistics systems to support great power competition? And do we have what it takes to be able to, as you uh, mentioned, agilely move our forces to where we need to go and sustain them um, uh, in order to react uh, more quickly? Uh, Ma'am, that's, that's a great question. I would say it's, it's very problematic. I think, uh, you know, actually in the defense strategy, logistics is highlighted, as is information as an independent warfighting domain. Um, in a sense, the strategy is trying to take the focus away from how many BCTs do you have, how many capital ships, et cetera, and saying what are the forces that you need all through the chain from, from A to Z that will allow you to complete the mission. So I think logistics is crucial, including civilian logistics. I think the basic logic there should be that we need our forces and our logistics chain to be able to operate under plausible uh, Chinese or Russian sustained attack, that you're never going to have the total sanctuary that we enjoyed in the unipolar polar era. Now, that doesn't mean everything has to be uh, perfectly secure. Every satellite we put into space does not have to survive. But as an architecture, it needs to operate. And the other key thing, and I think a really core piece of the logic here is, we want our architecture to be able to work in a way that for the Chinese or the Russians to attack it, they will have to escalate and expand the war in ways that are bad for them. What are some of the investments that the department can make to ensure this logistical readiness um, so that our military will be able to provide the warfighters in the field with the appropriate resources and to execute the national defense strategy? And then you talk about this, you know, this logistical architecture. What do we need to do to build this uh, logistical architecture to where we need it to be? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly it will entail in terms of investments. I would imagine it's going to be uh, uh, kind of a soup to nuts thing. A couple of points that I would say are uh, we would want exercising, a realistic exercising. I mean, in a sense, something like the Operation Reforger model of the 1980s, which is basically how are you getting from the United States to the conflict zone uh, abroad while under attack? That will tell us a lot about what we need and where our vulnerabilities are. I'd also say selective investments in things like cruise and ballistic missile defense, specifically designed at parts, crucial nodes in our uh, logistics architecture, both in the United States and abroad, that again, not are, that are not going to be able to give us perfect security. But if the, if the Russians have to launch 100 missiles to take out Ramstein rather than two, that's going to be very important for Germany's political decision making. Uh, thank you, and, and this is both for you from, and, and, and uh, also for uh, Dr. Ratner. Um, should we be doing something about the Chinese's low-end um, uh, capabilities, such as their Coast Guard vessels, their fishing fleets, that have been known to interfere with maritime and naval traffic? They have this whole, it's not all just their military, but they have all of these other low-end network of, of things that are out there. Uh, that's exactly right, and in fact, they have a maritime militia that's knitted together, fisheries and, and, and Coast Guard with the PLA. I, I do think uh, we should approach these vessels and forces uh, based, upon the, uh, based upon their behavior and not the color of the, their hull. So if there are uh, Coast Guard ships uh, engaging in coercive military activity, particularly if the PLA is parked over the horizon, I don't think we should... Uh, treat them like law enforcement vessels. We should treat them like military vessels. Uh, and the other uh, thing that we can do in this space that we haven't done nearly enough of is information warfare and strategic messaging, where we have uh, an immense amount of intelligence that's not particularly sensitive, that doesn't require unknown sources and methods about Chinese Coast Guard and other forms of illegal and, and coercive activity in the South China Sea and elsewhere, and we ought to be uh, splashing that across newspapers all across the region every day of the week. And, and uh, from my experience in government, it was incredibly hard to unlock this intelligence, to even share it with close partners. Uh, and we ought to have uh, much faster and, and more widespread declassification authority on this information. Senator, if I just might pick up yes. your first question, if I might. Um, our strategy so often depends on reinforcement, particularly in Europe, and we've seen and demonstrated through many exercises through the alliance um, some of the unanticipated difficulties we've had in moving forces across borders uh, in the European domain to prepare for the Russian challenge. It's partly why we saw the NATO summit establish a new logistics command to be based in Germany, 
why we have underway a military mobility initiative that really requires working with the European Union uh, on how to facilitate uh, movement of our armed forces across territories, and why what we're doing with this Three Seas initiative in Central Europe is so important because we lack in many places the cross-border infrastructure required for this type of mobility, and I'd factor that into the strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.